Thank you very much. So I think AT uh, Dato just uh, proposed that we just speak for about 15, 20 minutes and then I'll take questions. So thank you very much. I think the reason uh, for my uh, presence here is because all of you are here and it's such a pleasure and honor. But when AT calls and Gopal calls and Mikey calls, well, obviously I've got to be here. Thank you, Dato Rajeshekar, for a very good introduction. I hope you can all hear me. And if in case you can't hear me, let me know. I'll try to just fix my mic or speaker or whatever. Now, uh, Dato AT said that this is the highest attendance, 50 people. So somebody said, it's because of my photograph on that advertisement that he put out. But I must first of all have a disclaimer. That photograph was taken some 16 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a new photograph. Video. Then people will know that you don't look the same. Yeah. So I think it's very important for us to understand that staying productive is a very important word. Because in today's context, I think people are talking about post-COVID. This afternoon, we had a conversation with an airline company. And the airline company probably thinks that this is going to take another year to go away. My fellow professors are talking about two years to go away. Some people are talking about three months, four months to go away. But it's interesting in the month of early, early January, I think, one of my directors at the board meeting talked about a virus from Wuhan. And she said, it's better for all of us to go and get the flu vaccine. But none of us took it very serious. And when the lockdown came on March 17th, the announcement came, everybody was in a state of shock. So I think the most important thing for us to understand that in moments like this, this is a crisis never heard of. My father, my late father used to tell me that when he used to be in Gimas and Malacca and the Japanese were in what was then known as Malaya occupation, for four years, they had similar situation. There was a huge crisis. But today what we have is, it's not just a health crisis because you now know that it's slightly different. It's not just a health crisis. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. From a health crisis, it has become an economic crisis. So you have the Prihatin and they talked about, let's say, 5 billion and they talked about another 50 billion, which they're opening tomorrow through the Dana Jamin scheme. But the, they talked about the Prihatin, but within a couple of weeks, the money is used up. Obviously, because if you ask, uh, probably the president, Gopal, you will say from SME, there are so many uh, SMEs around, but only about 10,000 or 5,000 have been able to receive the money. And the banks have got to take some level of risk. And therefore, they say, I'll only pay to those who have got profitable track record. But the moment there is a profitable track record, that's it. It's gone. Number two, you start talking about the new stimulus package that's coming out with Dana Jameen, where Dana Jameen and MOF is participating in risk taking. 80% of the risk, you'll find that you'll have to do a lot of documentation, everything. Now, from a health crisis, it became an economic crisis. From an economic crisis, what we are now facing is it's going to become a social crisis. People are going to lose jobs. Okay, I think Dato Rajeshekar is there in uh, the Human Resource Development Fund. They're trying to talk about uh, the Ministry of Human Resources is talking about wage subsidy through either SOXO or the other program. But people are saying, well, they're running out of funds because a lot of people have applied and it's just a crisis that unheard of. When people don't have money, when people do not have food on the table, what are they going to do next? You are going to have a real crisis of great proportion because people will do strange things because they need food, they need money. So there was a guy who came by and we were ordering food outside and this young guy came in his motorbike to deliver food. And when he gave us the food, I gave him a 10 ringgit and the guy said, no, no, you have already given me the money, you've already paid for it. I said, no, 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 you are putting your life at risk 
for us. So here is 10 ringgit. And I could just see the smile on his face and the thankfulness and the gratitude on his face, which just explains that he is thankful to God that he has had that job and somehow he's able to survive for the day. Now, just imagine if there were lots of people who are going to lose jobs. And I think lots of people have lost jobs. So employment is going to be a very serious problem. And if you find that today in countries like India or Indonesia, people who are daily wage earners are going to find it incredibly difficult to survive because they don't have an earning. So this is the situation. This is a crisis of great proportion. you got a health crisis, number one. You are, have to be very careful. You really don't know where you're going, what you're doing. Number two, it's going to be a serious economic crisis. Liquidity crunches, cash flow problems. If you have borrowed money, there was this drama last week about whether we need to pay interest on the deferred installments, etc. So there is this huge crisis of tremendous proportion. But right in the background of this, I think it's very important for us to understand that we have to salute our frontline healthcare workers who are putting online their lives to save humanity. And I think just imagine the doctors, the nurses, and all the hospital staff. And I think it's just timely that we must salute them. But to me, I think when there is a crisis, a lot of people used to talk about the Chinese description of crisis. You flip it on another side, you will find that it's not just crisis, but it's also an opportunity. I'm not sure whether, AT, you're going to be able to share my slides. Are you going to be able to share my slides, AT? You can, Tatsri. If you want to, I, uh, I'll pull it up. Shall yeah, I should you just up? pull it up just for a moment? Yeah. Tatsri is there. Thank you. Yeah, if you go to the second slide, please. Just give me a minute. Yeah, just click, just move on to the second slide if you can. Yeah, so you see is what that... happened is, yeah, that's the one. Thank you very much. No, no, early can. Yeah, yeah. Sooner or later comes a crisis. And I think this is what Robert Collier said, and we have to deal with it. And when is a crisis reached? when there are questions that we cannot answer. So when somebody asks us a question and asks us this question and say, when is this going to be solved? We don't have an answer. Will we find a cure? We don't have an answer. When will we find a vaccine? We don't have an answer. There are trials, there are numerous things. So you find politicians have this flip flop and that's why people are beginning to respect bureaucrats like the New Zealand doctor or Fauzi in the United States or like no Risham in Malaysia, because they just give you the facts and are basically stating something that's very transparent. So what does this mean? No one has the answers. And this is what the Harvard Business School calls a marathon. It's not going to get resolved today. It's not going to get resolved in the next quarter. It's going to be a marathon. And therefore, we have to deal with it. Could you just move to the next slide? And this is what a friend of mine and on the University Board of Governors who said the scenario is it's an unprecedented crisis. It's Earth 2.0. And the new normal is going to be all of those things. Whether it's social distancing, I would like to remove that word and call it physical distancing because we want to be socially close to one another but we need that physical distance. We want to talk about the way we interact with one another, maybe technology is gonna take over our lives. The way we are going to economically behave, we have to be far more careful. The way we have to go out and interact with people, we need all our protective equipment. We need to have a mask and so on and so on. IR 4.0, uh, Huawei's 5, 5G, all these things are going to take over Earth. And the Earth, you will find, has got less pollution. People use less oil. Therefore, there is an impact on the energy prices and so on and so on and so on. Our lives have changed. So as entrepreneurs, as business people, our lives have changed. The nature is now telling us, behave yourself. 
In Indian history, they used to call this as Kali Yugam. Kali Yuga means, look, if you don't behave yourself, the world, the world is going to come to an end. And I think the whole word, the mantra is sustainability. What is sustainable? Greed is not sustainable. What Charles Andy called Chindugo. Chindugo means even if I've got 12 channels on my TV, that's not good enough. I want another 50 channels. If I've got three air conditions, that's not good enough. I need another five. In India, this was a great ex ex example. People said you can order online. You cannot go out to the shops, but people will deliver. But people are ordering air conditioning and refrigerators online rather than medicine and food. So I think the word is Earth 2.0 is about sustainability. But the most important thing is two questions. Who do you want to be now? Who are you going to be now? Are you going to care for the earth? Are you going to care for your neighbor? Are you going to care for your employees? Are you going to care for your friends? Are you going to care for your family? Who are you going to be now? Who do you want to be now? And most important, who do you want to be when this is over? This crisis is going to be over. There's no doubt about it. But when this is over, who do you want to be? when this is over? And I think these two questions you got to answer because no one else can answer. Can you Madhavan move on to the next slide, please quickly. <laughs> so this is what Penny Zanker talked about in the productivity zone. I talked about productivity because <clears throat> I'm one of those people who really enjoy work. My passion is work. I love my work and I am busy. I work 12, uh, 13 hours a day. <clears throat> I've just, uh, when I became a senior citizen, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but when I became a senior citizen, I, I realized I became a senior citizen because I went to New Central to watch a movie and I think A.T. and his wife were also there. <clears throat> I bought the ticket and then uh, my little daughter, I got two sons and a daughter, and my daughter came and my daughter said, Dad, you know, the ticket for us was 12 ringgit, but the ticket for you was 6 ringgit. I said, why? He said, Dad, do you, don't you know senior citizens get 50% discount? I said, tear the ticket, go and buy me a new ticket for 12 ringgit because I'm not old, because I wanted to feel very young. But, you know, most people find that when you get older, they probably slow down or they get more active. It's either one. Now, to me, I got active. And then when the lockdown came, I stayed home. My wife said, stay home. Because one of the things that they said is, anybody who has reached 60 years and above is going to be a risk group, so stay home. Now, all these years, my wife would ask me or my secretary in the office or my staff, what time am I coming home? Now she said, are you planning to go out? Because she had to find a way how to deal with me. I'm in the house all the time. And I'm sure you get all these WhatsApp messages, videos, everything, how people are finding it difficult to treat this space, how people are finding it difficult to treat this entire time. We have so much time on our hands. Can you believe Tony Fernandez is in the house all the time? 99.5% of all his aircraft fleet is on the ground. Now, this is why Penny Zanka said productivity. Now, I might be in the house, but I'm, I have to remain productive. And she said four things. Purpose. What do I want to achieve? Number two, language. Positive language. In Tamil, those days, AT used to say in one seminar, Unnal Mudiyam Tambi, you can do it. Number three, focus on my goals. I cannot let go of my goals. Physiology. My body and my mind must be fit. Physiology, I have to exercise, I have to eat right, I have to eat at the right time, I have to sleep at the right time, I have to get up at the right time, like what Robin Sharma says, the 5 a.m. club. And so if I can get the purpose, language, focus and physiology in, I'm going to be productive. And I think it's important for us how we can get the health-mind connection. Quickly, let's move on to the next Madhavan. So what do I do? 
the first thing I learned, the first week, March 18th, I found it a bit difficult because I couldn't go out. I had to stay home. <laughs> so I said, good, let me set a productive routine. I will get up at 6.30 every morning, but 6.30 to 8.30 is my two hour break. I exercise, I read the newspapers, I say my prayers, I finish my morning chores right from brushing my teeth to the toilet. I dress up, I exercise, I dress up, and I get to this home office of mine, 9.30. And I log into my computer and send a good morning message to my entire staff. I set up a productive routine. I go down because my Apple Watch tells me I need to breathe or go for a walk at 11, at 11. And I come back and I come back immediately in 15 minutes. One o'clock I go for lunch. And I come back at 2, I finish the day at 5.30. I'm done. And I go and watch Netflix or I watch Vanaway Law, I watch whatever. But I set a productive routine. And 10.30, I'm back into bed. I do my reading in the evening. So the productive routine is very important because you can't say because of MCO, my movement control is also locked down. We can't say that. Life has to go on. And in order for me to set up my business, I have never been busy. Today is the public holiday and I've been more busy than a normal day. Be accountable for your time because whatever time you spend, you have to be accountable. Be flexible and adaptable because you are in home with your family. Therefore, there might be things you need to do for your wife, for your children, for your parents. Be flexible, adapt, share. Share whatever we have with whoever you can. And at the end of the day, review, review, review accomplishments. It's very important because you are a business leader. You got to lead by example, manage by example. And I think this is something that's very important. You want to do charity. There are so many charities. I've done a little bit on my own, but the best is examples, Udharanam, they say in Tamil. So I think it's very important for us to set that. Could we just move on to the next one, please? Yeah. And I think it's very, very important for us to remember that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Just remember that a couple of years ago, I'm not sure which year was it. I think it was 98, 2000. You had SARS and then you had Ebola. And this is something that's rapidly changing. No one has got the answers. <clears throat> I have a friend of mine in Massachusetts and he laid off 700 of his restaurant workers he, because the restaurant was closed down. There was nothing he could do. So he had to just put the 700 people away because there's nothing he could do. I have a friend of mine in Malaysia who runs a chain of FNB restaurants. He's in trouble. <clears throat> So there are large companies with 30,000 people, 20,000 people. They just can't do anything. Back with us, we have a very large workforce. Just can't come to work because it's very nervous. It's very risky. So you've got to set up new processes, new systems in order for us to get on. So please remember, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So what did I do? <laughs> The last book that I wrote was 2014 January. I couldn't write. I used to write in the mid nineties until 2010, one book or every year or one book every two years experience. But since 2014, life has been very busy, being an entrepreneur, being running two public listed companies, uh, responding to stakeholders, it's been a big challenge. So I've had no time, but here I said, okay, I found some time. So I finished one more book. So this is my 16th book. It took me a long time uh, from 2014 to 2020, but I have one accomplishment. Now, the most important thing that I'm going to leave you with is Robin Sharma. I've never listened much to Robin Sharma, but I listened to him this time. And he said, follow the rule 90-91. For the next 90 days, next 90 days, every day, the first 90 minutes, focus on one high priority item. Next 90 days, 
Every day, focus 90 minutes on one high priority item. In order for you to move the needle, you are focused. I talked about productivity zone, you're focused and you move the needle in order to progress because that's the time you are going to achieve what you want to achieve. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a very tough time, particularly for business. So one of the key things people say is, nobody is paying me money, therefore I'm not going to pay my vendors. If nobody is paying me and I don't pay my vendors and the vendor doesn't pay the vendor, how do we keep the business community moving? We can't move the business community moving. We need to work as communities to keep the ecosystem. We need to keep the trust. If we can't keep the trust, we can't keep the ecosystem, then I think we are going to have a huge problem. Therefore, remember those two questions. Who do you want to be now? And who do you want to be when this is over? How do we keep this community spirit going? Let's have that firm leadership, firm purpose. Of course, we need to be flexible. We need to be adaptable. And believe me that when there is a crisis, it's always for a purpose. And I'm sure we'll come out fighting fit and strong and we'll be better than this. So thank you so much for listening to me. I think it's about 23 minutes. I've gone a little bit overboard. Happy to answer some questions if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I will pass the baton back to AT. Thank you. Thank you, Tanshree. It's a wonderful uh, session because uh, not only the ecosystem, we are into the 50, 51st day yeah. of uh, MCO 1, 2, 3, now 4. Uh, which is now in the conditional MCO. So we have also been introduced to so many uh, acronyms uh, from uh, MCO to conditional MCO and then uh, extended MCO. So we have all the music uh, into our thought processes. Thank you. Uh, while everybody is preparing for a question, uh, um, especially on Zoom, I've got one question which is there on uh, uh, Facebook asked by one of our very good friends and also a very close uh, member of Mikey, Selva Nagapan of uh, Knowledge Group. Uh, he says, yes, Tansri, you have, uh, your experience in education sector is very vast. How do you look uh, in terms of online learning as you move forward into the next couple of years? Uh, I think we have Tansri, shifted you online. That question first? Yeah, yeah, I will do. So the question is, how do we uh, view online learning? I think we know for a long time, online learning is going to be the future. But you know, the last century, the school was the best creation. It brought together people, it structured formal learning. Then the school became a problem because individual needs could not be addressed. And the schools became a system and the system could not be reformed. So now we can't do face-to-face -face teaching. The ministry has said that. So it's all back to online learning right from K to 12 and higher education. So I think the most important thing is we had to do was to go online learning, but we do have a challenge because how do our medical students, pharmacy students, physiotherapy students go clinical classes? Now the hospitals have said, look, we don't want them to come and put themselves at risk. It will take a little bit longer. So we'll have to figure that out. But certainly everything else has gone online. And I think people have just loved it. It's just that you got to go in smaller bites. You can't do, let's say, a three-hour class. You have to do three one-hour classes. You'll have to do assignments. And people are beginning to find that, look, it's not different. Um, uh, it's, I'm sorry. It is probably different, but it's not less efficient. People love it. And uh, I have done webinars for a long time, but I've never done so many webinars in the last one month, you know. So I've done webinars for a London group. I've done it for a Chennai group. I've done it for a KL group. I've done it for education. I've done it for many different people. So to me, <coughs> Earth 2.0, the new normal, I think online learning is going to be the new normal as well. It's going to stay. 
So I think it's very important for us. And I think today, if you go to Udemy, if you go to Coursera, for $14.95, you can actually learn a skill. You can learn Excel, you can learn, uh, let's say, how do you actually time attendance? There's so many things you can learn in for $15, $20. The only question is, you will have to just imagine that the person in front of you is real, but I'm sure it can be done. I hope I answered that question, Salva. Thank you. Thank you, Tanshri. Tanshri, I, 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 I've just got a little bit of addition to what you mentioned and also a question which sure. is, uh, I spoke to a friend today morning. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the question, going, going online, it seems to be the current uh, uh, default position because there is no way you can do face-to-face -face teaching. But the concept of learning, the teaching part can be taken care of by going, um, you know, migrating online. But the concept of learning, it has a lot to do with what you actually was on your last slide also. It's not a sprint, but it's a marathon. In a marathon, yeah. you need somebody to pace yourself. Unfortunately, when I'm sitting in front of a, a screen and I'm unable to pace except myself. So how do you get that idea of, you know, the rough and tumble of uh, learning in school? Doesn't matter whether they're in primary, secondary, or even uh, tertiary education. That pacing, how is that going to happen, Tansri, especially in online uh, online ecosystem? I think it's going to be, uh, it's, I think the, we have to move away. I think you use, you use the word, you know, it's learning is a journey. It's not just that class, you know, therefore what happens is today, some of those schools and uh, universities, they don't just have lectures. They have living group discussions. They have tutorials, they have assignments and everything is online. So the entire ecosystem, online ecosystem, is completely digitalized, yeah. It's not just digital, it's not just putting something on technology and letting technology taking over. It's basically the process of digitalization is changing the way we view it, is changing the way we approach it. It becomes part of our life. So t t today, many people, primarily use the mobile phone and uh, everything is actually convergence on the mobile phone. I still use my iPad. I still use my notebook. I don't use a desktop anymore, but I use some of these things. And to me, I think the important thing is what works for you is good. But one thing, the realization that online learning is here to stay is something that's very important. And delivering learning online the teachers, the lecturers, they have to change a little bit. You can't deliver content too much because it's no more the guru and the sishya. It's no more knowledge rest with the guru's head. Knowledge is all over the internet. I give them a hyperlink. They can click on the hyperlink and you can actually find out anything. So primarily that's what I think is important. Now back to us in the education sector, <laughs> I, I do not know how many of you saw that letter because there was an article that was written by a Hong Kong newspaper called the Asian Sentinel, who said the private sector education industry has collapsed in Malaysia. And the last thing is the MCO. I, I, wrote, I wrote back and my article came out and I said, look, is it a collapse or a rejuvenation? And to me, it's a rejuvenation because we have been trying to reform people for a long time. We have not been able to reform. So we find children today, they're not able to go to school, but the most important thing is they enjoy learning on Google classrooms. So that's basically the difference. But Malaysia as an industry, the private sector industry is a 31 billion ringgit industry moving forward to 65 billion but to get this you need foreign students to come now how will foreign students come because you have closed up the aviation airspace is closed because of security reasons because of health reasons so we are now saying the first semester let's say somebody is doing vba or it they will stay in their countries but learn online and everything will just go like that. But that's the education industry. But look at the tourism. The guys do not want to, so most, most of my friends in the FNB industry say, the rentals are not going down, 
but I have to pay my salary. The government says, please, I'll give you a wage subsidy. Do not actually retrench people. But how am I going to survive if I had a thousand employees working for me in the F&B industry or the hotel industry. I might be able to get some people to come and stay in the hotel, like quarantine the people, and but the government pays you a certain amount of money, which is all right for survival. But how long am I going to take in order to get over my cash flows, etc.? So I think one of the things that we have done is we have put in an entire digital ecosystem, try to get away from anything manual, Everything is driven by technology, and that, that's, that's the way we're going to do. But I think the malls are affected, the retail industry is affected, the tourism is affected, and my wife was sharing with me something that what Ravindran said here. The number of people going to the pawn shops have increased, which is sad. But this is a reflection that we have a social crisis. And in order for us to overcome that, we will have to think ways and means of overcoming it. So I think as a business, we need to have a clear cash flow. I think we need a visibility of the cash flow. Every week I need to have visibility of the cash flow. I need to get rid of any fixed expenses. I have to bring down the operating expenditure dramatically because revenue for someone like running a restaurant is non-existent and I don't know when's that going to come. Now, some people have done differently. I know that there is this guy called Chennai Spice in uh, Cyberjaya. He says, look, I will, he has just joined up a digital ecosystem. So he says, look, I will deliver food, but he has had the arrangement with Panda and Grab and therefore, Business is affected, but at least I can survive. I get the food out. So I've taken some of those questions, unless there is, uh, there's one more question from Ravindran, actually running an SME in other industries, what do you think are some of the main levers they have to somehow learn and implement in the short term? <clears throat> the one thing about running an SME is it's always going to be very simple. I think it's gonna be, how do I maintain my revenue or get some visibility on my revenue? But at the same time, I manage my outflows, my expenditure. And if I have too many of those fixed costs, then I have to get rid of those fixed costs because it's going to be very, very unstable. It's going to be impossible to predict. I have to cut my losses as quick as possible. Otherwise, I'm going to be in a big problem. And one of the challenges is, I know Dr. Rajeshekar is here, they are in the HRDF are saying, look, let's try and make sure employment is protected. Boris Johnson in the UK with Rishi Sunak is saying, let's protect employment. Uh, in the US, Congress has passed the bill say protect employment. Now, when you talk about employment, there's a formal sector and there is an informal sector. The formal sector, we can try and help, but let me tell you, it's going to be a very, very painful, very painful. Lots of people are going to lose jobs because there isn't, I think, SMEs, multinationals, everybody is going to become, uh, they're going to learn to become efficient. They're going to use more and more technology, become more productive, productivity, and it's going to result in loss of jobs. When jobs are lost, that's not because people are going to lose jobs are not people who, with, who are indispensable. People are going to lose jobs are people who don't have the skills to survive. Therefore, it's going to be reskilling and upskilling these people. Our own children, we have to reskill and upskill them so that we have to make sure that employment uh, across the nation is protected. Back to the SME, I think the whole the cash flow is the lifeline of a business, and you'll have to continue to keep an, uh, a, a clear eye on it. Uh, I am, I'm not sure of this last question that Nara has asked. Maybe Nara is probably far more an expert in answering that. Uh, what is the issue of the impact of on Forex and inflation? To me, inflation is bound to happen. 
because of supply chain. Supply chains are going to be strained, stressed out. <coughs> you got to bring the vegetables from Cameron's. You got to bring things across from outside. Most of the airlines are surviving no more on passengers, but on cargo. So it's going to happen. And I think there's so much of stimulus package. I think every country is stimulating the economy with all, all kinds of things. Where is the money going to come? I'm sure that last week or the week before, you know that in the futures, oil price for the first time went negative. It went negative. So if some, some you wanted to sell some oil to somebody in the future, you'll have to pay money to, for that fellow to take off the oil from you. Can you just believe this? It's unheard of. It's just unheard of. So how are we going to actually continue to stimulate the economy? Economists call this, I'm sure that if Manogar was here or Kaladar Govindan was here, they would say they go for quantitative easing. And when it's quantitative easing, then the challenge is it's going to be, you are going to find inflation. So my wife was telling me this morning because I take apples and she went to village Grossa and she said in the market, it used to be uh, whatever the box was 20 ringgit or whatever. And village Grossa, it was 50 ringgit. So you see the supply chain pushes up the price. And obviously the guy operating has also got a cost. So he's pushing up the price. So definitely it's going to be inflation. It's going to be unemployment. It's going to be at its highest unless and until we are going to take care of it. Uh, I think, I think uh, Ravindran's question, I think the finance minister has sorted out, I think, I think it's been sorted out. I think Bank Nagara has instructed the banks. I think that's that's done. Uh, so I think it's about watching ourselves. So to many, you know, when the market opened on March 18th, I have two counters, SMRT and Minda Global. I've never seen in my life the price crash so much. At one point, we went down to 1.5%. It was like everybody was throwing. And all I did from nine to five was to watch the market and keep doing whatever, calling friends to buy, calling institutional investors to buy, using our own funds to support it, buy. <clears throat> because, you know, whenever that I buy, we have to make an announcement. And how do you actually do? What do you do? And then you look at Bursa, everybody was collapsing. So one of the first things we said is try lobby to stop the short selling. Try and see when will this end? Can the market be closed for a little bit of time? Government didn't want to buy it because in the Philippines, they closed the market. And when they reopened the market, it was even worse. So it was a nightmare for me personally. I think it was a one week of stress, tremendous pressure. Luckily, we didn't have very many margin calls because if we had borrowed money, then we would have had margin calls and would have had to support. So thank good God, we didn't have that. So it was all right. And the market completely stabilized over a period of time with all the news. So I think uh, if somebody is going to give you quick fix answers, please believe me, there are no quick fix answers. They are lying. They're probably going to give you their judgment based on their experiences. And it may not fit your experience or your situation. So you will have to make the decision. You will have to take the call. And please believe me, if you think uh, there is a stimulus package, move fast. Because I have friends who moved on day one, they announced the, the Prihatin and the SMEs. They managed to have a good relationship with the bank. They got the million ringgit. Then, of course, now the 75,000 ringgit has come with uh, Bank Simpana National, I think. And people have moved fast. So move very fast, very quick. Now there is this Dana Jameen package which I think they're opening tomorrow, minimum of 20 million. Uh, if you had a big business like an SME, like a factory, and you needed to justify. But please remember, it will be frustrating because the banks have to participate in some level of risk taking. And while the banks are in the business of managing risk, they don't like risk. They, 
uh, I always believe this because in my experience, I have found this. The banks give you an umbrella when there is no rain. And the banks take away the umbrella when it's raining. Uh, and I know that when we never needed any money, I will have banks lining up to give us money. And when you need some money, oh, the banks will say, oh, it's very tough, tough call. I think it's difficult. And that's why we need relationships with the bank. I think you need to have these relationships with the bank because it's what the banks call KYC, know your customer. If they know you, they trust you, they judge you, they're going to support you. But it's also your responsibility not to let the bank down because it's not the bank's money. There's no such thing as a bank. The bank has got depositors and shareholders. So it's a two-way process. And I think the government is also trying to help us. I think it's also a two-way process. I think we just have got to do our own, own things. And I think John F. Kennedy said this beautifully, ask not what the country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I think ask not, what the community can do for you, but ask what you can do for the community. Ask not what the employees can do for you, but ask yourself what you can do for the uh, employees. And believe me, uh, I've been in business uh, for probably 35, 37 years. And I went public, I took my company public in the year 2006. And it was such, I had no connections, no contacts. I just went professional. It was a nightmare. It was very tough. I was frightened because I'd put up all my life savings trying to go public. And if I didn't make it, I probably start all over again. But in 2006, I went public and then we grew. And I think the main thing that I, I think is important is two quotes. I gave Ahmad Paradas, Dato Ahmad Paradas, Managing Director of UEM in the year 2005, a copy of my book, The Magic of Making Training Fun. And he said, Palan, I just want you to do one thing for me. Go, thank you for your book, but I want you to go and read this book. And he said, go and read this book, The Magic of Thinking Big. The magic of thinking big. Open up your mind. There's so much you can do. This is Uber. This is AirAsia. This is WhatsApp. Open up. You don't have to go to that level, but in a smaller level, you can be at the next Davies restaurant or you can be uh, Papa Rich. You can be something. And then as I walked out, he said to me something very important. He said, Palan, if you want to be the person you want to be, you must walk, talk, and behave like the person you want to be. So if you want to be the person you want to be, you must walk, talk, and behave like the person you want to be. So how we are in public, we must also be in private. It can't be different. The private self and the public self should be together. Then the banks trust you. The government agencies trust you. Your customers trust you. Employees trust you. Your friends trust you. Everybody trusts. And always, I think that's important for us to take in. Uh, I've had a challenge in 1998. I think it was a very tough time. I didn't experience 87, 88, but 97, 98, I experienced. 2008, I experienced, yeah. And this has been a nightmare. But look, I think it's the internal strength. I think it's the power of the prayer. It's the power of the friendship. I've never seen so many of my friends come out and help me out at this difficult time. Uh, and I've also seen uh, some of my banks come and actually support me in a greater spirit. And therefore, I have a responsibility. We as a corporation have a responsibility. All of us as a chamber have a responsibility to keep the ecosystem going. The ecosystem is all of us, not one of us. So I think I don't have uh, any other questions. I think there is a question from Post Laju. Okay, I think uh, it's a standard answer. I will leave that there, Ravindran. I think Andy also talked about China conquering the world economy. I think you have got enough on the web. You can actually see that and they will answer you. I just saw one video. I'm not sure how many of you saw the video. Trump says, who the hell thought about 
this coronavirus or this crisis. And Obama five years ago talks about it and he says, maybe we will have a pandemic crisis in five years time. So we must prepare today. And I think it's when there is a problem that there are also opportunities. So I think stay safe, stay brave and stay confident. And I'm sure that we'll be able to take it further. I think uh, I would like to thank Mikey and I've always told Gopal that look, uh, let's make it as a business networking. Let's lobby with the government. I think networks are very powerful. I think Seth Godin said this beautifully, uh, the power of marketing. And they talked about six degrees of separation. If you want to see someone, there are only six handshakes. You can get to that person whoever it is. So I think that's the power of this community. So I wish you well and thank you for the honor and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you guys. Thank you so much.